Get a Book Dot Today presents Fleet Commander Recon, Book 4 in the Starships at War series by Shane Lachlan Black, copyright 2018. Chapter 18. Attention on Deck Commander Jace Hunter and her officers came to attention as Sergeants Hall and Benning brought their weapons to order. A moment later, the still unsteady legs of Admiral Charles Hughes carried the Psy Key's newest guest down the command shuttle's external egress steps with Dr. Doverly's help. The Admiral returned Jace's salute. Sergeant Dupree watched the older man carefully. Her orders were to protect the doctor and the commander's crew first. It was up to Jace to decide how best to protect the Admiral. All part of the Division of Responsibilities experienced Skywatch fleet and Marine officers performed almost subconsciously. Jace Hunter, Hughes said with a warm tone. I haven't seen you since your brother's last promotion ceremony. How's your mom? That She's well, sir, and she asked me to send along her good wishes. Good, good. The doctor here tells me I'm scheduled for a debriefing. I hope I can be of some help. Aye, sir. Gunnery Sergeant Hall will see you to your quarters and provide anything you need. My officers will convene in CIC in ten hours to provide you with our current sit-rep. Welcome aboard, sir. Sergeant Hall took the man's arm and led him towards the crew quarters. Once Hughes had left the shuttle deck, Jace closed the personnel door. Hunter took young Sergeant Benning aside. How are you feeling, Andrew? Give me an order, ma'am. You are now Admiral Hughes' body man. If anyone gets near him without my personal authorization, leave them where you find them. Affirmative? Gunnery Sergeant Hall and COB will spell you. Yes, ma'am. Carry on, Sergeant. A giant of a man followed Hall and the Admiral towards the crew quarters. Any complications, Doctor? Hunter asked. Physically, he's fine, at least from what I was able to gather aboard Argent. Mentally, he's pink clouding. He acts like the proud grandfather at a family barbecue. In reality, I think he's trying to compensate for the fact he has seen and heard things human beings weren't meant to see or hear. He's also been in the physiological equivalent of a coma for nearly two weeks. He's got severe PTSD, and he's malnourished. Then we're not taking orders from him for the time being? Commander Mallory asked. No, he's not fit for duty. I've already assigned him to recovery, Doverly replied. I expect once he gets his strength and bearings back, he'll get ornery again. But we'll cross that bridge later. Nevertheless, we are all giving him the same deference we would give any flag officer, as regulations require, Hunter said. Let's make sure everyone considers that a standing order for now. In the meantime, he could be the key to uncovering Atwell's motives. And this ship is the key to Atwell's plan, Cobb concluded. I want to report on what steps are being taken to investigate this vessel's structure and systems, Cobb, and I want a status report on your work before we debrief Hughes. Then I need you to work out a rotation with Hall and Benning. I want the Admiral under 24-hour guard. Aye, ma'am. Any trouble aboard, Argent? Hunter asked. We left a rather surprised pair of Admiral James's goons behind, ma'am, Dupree replied. I expect they'll be reporting to Skywatch Command by the time we all get to CIC. Whether Admiral James's staff believes them or not remains to be seen, Doverly added. Very well. The commander activated her comlink. Hunter to bridge. Bridge, Curtis. Set course for the Grand Park's jump gate. All ahead full. Aye, ma'am. Course on the board. ETA 16 hours. Very well. Hunter closed the channel. You all look like hell. Let's get some sleep. Tomorrow we'll put together a plan to find the 98th Recon and find out why my brother's strike force lost four ships over Bayon 3. Before I forget, Jace, Honora said, 
Both Zack and Sabrina want to know who in Blaze's Admiral Ham is. Jace rolled her eyes and grinned. My brother and I quietly conspired after the engagement with Agamemnon at Uniform Tango. We felt it was necessary to come up with a safeguard in the event our own forces were somehow automated and used against us. So we ordered Yili and Chief Brogan to perform modifications to all the command computers in the Perseus formation keyed to the fictitious officer Admiral Ham. Any ship under our command that recorded that name via any real-time data link or comm channel automatically tripped our safety interlock, which instructed the command computer to disarm its weapons and power down its engines, unless one of us personally reactivated them with our authorization codes. And that's what happened to the Black Nine? Cobb chuckled. You knew it was automated? No doubt about it. I could tell by the way it was maneuvering and by the fact it went after our boat first and not the command shuttle. Then it fired point defense on a disarmed missile. A human crew wouldn't have made such elementary mistakes. It wasn't bad for an auto system, but a first-year cadet would have scored better on a simulation. That's the greatest story I've ever heard, Honora said. There was a pause while everyone waited to see if Jace was kidding. Admiral Ham, outstanding, Cobb roared. He laughed his way down the corridor towards a well-deserved rest. The other Psy Key officers followed, most shaking their heads. Chapter 19 Raymond Flynn lunged into the smoke-filled corridor and fired his sidearm again and again. The covering fire slammed into the bulkhead, causing the deck plates to shudder. Explosive electrical discharges strobed and sputtered along the blackened metal walls. The captain of the Constellation ducked back behind his makeshift barricade and released the energy pack on his weapon. It clattered to the floor a moment before he rammed a fresh pack into the emitter base. The ready lights along the pistol's right edge went from amber back to green. How many this time, Corporal? They're operating in groups of three, sir. Those weapons aren't regulation. I've never seen readings like this. Flynn swallowed a curse. Who the hell were these people, and why were they trying to commandeer his ship? He hit his comlink. Captain to engineering. A pause. Simmons. Give me some good news, Mark. They've done a number on us, sir. That weapon wasn't just an explosive. They had some kind of end-of-the-world EMP technology built into the warhead. Three of our four Cephalon structures are out of commission, and we can't run this ship on one computer. What about life support? The deck lurched as another explosion ripped through the ceiling circuitry only a few yards from Flynn's position. He heard the last few syllables of the engineer's reply, but they were overwhelmed by the noise and interference. The captain held a hand to his ear. Say again? The voice crackled over the combat frequency. We don't have positive control, Skipper. Are they still massed on Deck 11? Flynn shouted. Affirmative. We were boarded through the reload bays for our outboard missile launchers portside. Forward or aft? They moved on our aft engineering deck, sir. Security Marines stopped them at the Deck 12 repair lifts. They were moving towards aft reactor shielding. That gave Captain Flynn an idea. Get me life support control, engineer. Report back in five minutes. Flynn out. The captain turned to his men. We need to get past this whatever the hell it is and secure auxiliary control. If Mark can get me life support, we might be able to put a stop to this little war and get the Constellation back underway. That sounds like a great plan, sir. First, we have to deal with the fact we're outgunned three to one and we're wedged in a maintenance corridor like armed sardines, said Flynn's security chief. What if we... At that moment, a dark shape emerged from the smoke and lunged around the corner. His power-armor-clad hand narrowly missed Flynn's neck and left an ugly scraped dent in the bulkhead. The sound echoed like a cannon shot. Chief Bosa was upon the attacker in an instant. A brief violent struggle forced the armored enemy back into the corridor. Both men staggered as their arms and shoulders trembled before both ripped their hands free. Another powerful swing failed to connect, leaving the border off balance. Bosa slammed the enemy soldier into the bulkhead and drew his sonic knife with his off hand. A third attack overreached, and the chief plunged the lethal blade into the attacker's neck. A frightening whine shrieked in the narrow space. Sparks and arcing electrical energy spidered in all directions as the powerful vibrating blade ate through the composite surface. Finally, the soldier's shoulder applique burst into jagged pieces and he was thrown back against the metal wall. Let's move while we've got the advantage, Flynn ordered. His men scrambled around the corner as Bosa retrieved his weapon and the attacker's sidearm. Sir, the chief tossed his captain a second pistol just in time for Flynn to whirl and open up on two new attackers. 
A furious exchange ensued, with Captain Flynn firing two-handed as he charged. One was clipped across the arm as he turned to run. The other cried out and landed hard after two rounds punctured the back of his leg. Another explosion caused the corridor to lurch. Flynn steadied himself with one pistol as he stepped over two bodies and cracked a blaster grip into the third enemy soldier's chin. Auxiliary control is the next hatch. Life signs, Taro. Bosa ran a quick sensor check. The temperature inversion is still causing interference, sir. Nothing on the scope. We're clear to 15 yards. Beyond that, I can't make any guarantees. If we run into unexpected house guests, can you get their hats and coats? Flynn barked as he advanced to the magnetically sealed hatch leading to the Constellation's auxiliary control center. Aye, sir. The captain holstered one of his blasters and began working with the universal access console next to the sealed hatch. It was damaged, but functional. The auto system's display indicated the vessel was still at general quarters and that the security systems had been set to stand by. This meant attackers had either destroyed the subsystem or controlled enough vital systems on the ship to have blocked his crew's attempts to re-establish the functions of the deck alert circuitry. By design, Skywatch vessels had two independent security mechanisms. The deck alert subsystem was designed to assist Marines and security personnel in bringing the necessary firepower to bear in the event of a hull breach or other unauthorized boarding of a starship. The security matrix was separate from the deck alert system and primarily controlled access to vital systems. Once an officer gave the order to repel borders, the security matrix enhanced the automatic hatch lock status, collapsed the steps on all manual vertical access corridors, sealed the blast doors around the primary reactor, and deactivated the magneto lifts, which generally prevented access to the bridge. Aboard ships of the line, corridors were also equipped with both reflective and amplified force fields, which made it possible for Marines with attuned weapons to fire on attackers from behind screens that would deflect enemy energy weapons and kinetics. But that would allow Skywatch energy weapons fire to pass through. Few attackers had made the attempt to board a Skywatch capital ship, and those that had found their task considerably harder than they might have first estimated. While Constellation was not a capital vessel, her security and alert systems were quite capable. At the moment, they were doing a fine job of protecting auxiliary control, and they responded as programmed when Captain Flynn entered his three-factor override codes. The doors whispered open, revealing a relatively peaceful compartment. The lights were set at only 15% intensity, and the facility was abandoned, but all the circuitry and consoles appeared to be intact. The captain gestured back towards his men. Chief Bosa made his way up to Flynn's position and ran a quick hazards check. Atmosphere is good. No unusual readings or compounds. Looks like our friends never made it this far. Nigel, Greg, get those life support masks in case there's an environmental malfunction. Bosa, you take the universal and get me a status report. I'm going to work on communications. The two security marines slipped inside as Bosa reset the console and the captain resealed the hatch. Flynn switched his comlink. Mark, you promised me a status report. Life support control restored, Captain. Outstanding. Get me the deck alert subsystem back online and I'll buy the first round. We've secured auxiliary control and we are preparing to retake the ship. Report in two minutes. Flynn out. The Universal is up. Ray leaned down to look over Chief Bosa's shoulder. What have you got? The circular scope rotated through the entire cycle of views supplied by the Constellation's command computer. After a quick adjustment, the interface centered on those screens that displayed general status information for the bridge crew. Bosa started with the vital reactor, energy transfer, and engines, and worked his way towards the command functions. We're stopped in space. Reactors are up. Engines are up. We're still at general quarters. It appears two boarding parties got through our portside launchers but got hung up aft near Reactor 2's radiation shielding. They had a map and a plan, Chief. Agreed, sir. Whiskey India 5 led us right into a trap, and only heaven knows where they led as 808. Bosa continued cycling through the various information screens related to the situation aft of the portside missile launchers. The more Flynn watched, the more he realized the rumors about Skywatch involvement in the current crisis explained a lot. The Constellation was an older ship and had a fair number of weaknesses beyond the fact she was specialized for long-range standoff engagements with enemy ships. The Tombaugh-class DDWs were Skywatch's glass cannons. They performed best when they were parked in a battle group and able to lob big warheads at distant attackers in support of carriers and forward operations for line ships.
The Constellation and ships like her weren't designed to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with rival vessels. For one thing, her capital missiles were designed to cover many hundreds or thousands of miles before they even armed. And for another, she wasn't outfitted with the kind of hull and manpower to fight off point-blank weaponry and boarding parties. Ships like Exeter and Ajax were far better designed for the kind of smash-mouth combat the DDW hulls were well advised to avoid. The captain was well aware of these facts, but it didn't change his mind in the slightest. Heavyweight gloves or not, Ray Flynn was on a mission, and he wasn't going to let Privateer Captain Holland have all the fun. I'm pretty sure Pat would disagree, Chief, but the moment we get underway, we've got to catch up to Jolly Good and help him throw a net over that bloody fugitive ship. Vengeance, sir. They've got my tactical officer, and by the pound or penny, I'll have him. Deck alert systems are back under manual control. We will retake the Constellation. Our heavy weapon systems are undamaged, and our guests are gathering themselves nicely right under one of our overhead gun racks. I hope you like your entree served well done, Chief. Yes, sir. Chapter 20 I know why Atwell rigged this ship to blow itself and your boarding party into background radiation, Commander, Yili Curtis said as she strode into the Psy Keys Combat Information Center. And I also know what he's been up to for the last six months, an oblong device that looked very much like a translucent ball of bread dough clattered on the surface of the horizontal crystal reactive display in the center of the compartment and rolled to a stop in Jace's hand. Tiny glyphs were faintly visible inside the device. They faded and reappeared depending on where the viewer was standing and how the light intersected the object. Honora and Zack leaned close to get a better look. The pilot looked up and raised his eyebrows as he reached towards it. The engineer nodded. Jace handed it to him and he examined it. Unauthorized upgrade? Hunter asked. In a manner of speaking, Curtis pointed. I will bet you a case of scotch that device is the only thing that's been keeping Atwell under control. Hey, this scattering field emitters are built into this ship. We can appear and disappear just like the attackers at Station 19, and just like Echo Squadron at the Scorpion base. That device is how we can tie the alien tech into our drive field. Once we're operational, we can localize and manipulate the scattering field all we like. And as an added bonus, we can use the field itself as our power source. That explains how those handhelds worked without an independent battery or replenishing power supply. They just tied into the field, drew the necessary power, and then used it and the field orientation to create a wormhole from one point to the next, Zack said. Pretty nifty. Too bad we discovered the energy transfer technology too late to use it effectively against Barker's asteroid, Yili said. We might have headed a lot of this off. Instant space folder, Sabrina concluded. With the right modifications, we could probably use this thing to hop weapons across space. Only one problem, Yili sighed. Aiming this thing requires precision we're not used to. When you're operating in four or five dimensions at once, there's no room for error. Kind of like the problems with theoretical time travel, Honora offered. Yili nodded. Everyone thinks they can just snap their fingers and go back 100 years, but the truth is you have to make sure there is solid ground under you when you arrive. It's just as important when an object is in space as it is where. This thing ostensibly solves one problem, because no time passes in our universe for objects that aren't in four-dimensional space, but it creates another problem because all our equipment is designed to follow the laws of physics. When there are no laws of physics or new laws of physics, things can get a little unpredictable. You can say that again, Hunter muttered. Engineer, am I correct in presuming you can rig us up a device that can teleport this ship from one point to the next in four-dimensional space and do it without using the Psy Keys plant? Aye, ma'am. As long as that little egg holds itself together, this entire ship is basically a gigantic Ivis teleportation device. We can go anywhere we want, Honora said. Bayon 3? Hunter asked. I knew you were going to ask me that, Curtis said with a grin. That's why I team up with my very own signals expert. Zoni Tixia stepped into CIC right on cue with her own device. She placed it on the display table next to Yili's egg. This is a modified sensor reflector and the solid-state interpreter used by almost all Skywatch warships. When we train it on this thing, we don't get many readings back. But when we train our sensors to read and emit through it, we can see into other dimensions. Say again? Hunter raised an eyebrow. The teleporter doesn't just work in our universe, Zoni said. 
It is theoretically capable of creating wormholes from one level of existence to another. I think that's what happened to the crew of the Dunkirk. It also happened to the captain. I still have all the readings I gathered from our experiments when we encountered the Admiral's ship the first time. We had to wing it then. This thing allows us to do it with precision. The Dunkirk shifted dimensions when you boarded her the first time. Then Jason shifted dimensions again during your attempts to recover the ship. Then... Bayon 3 shifted dimensions, Zoni concluded. Remember, power isn't an issue for this thing because it is drawing all its energy from the field. My theory is since the planet didn't have to move, all the scattering field has to do is bend reality around it to create the exact same effect. It's really just a big magic trick for lack of a better explanation. Where is that field being generated? Zack asked. Raleo 2, Yili replied. All the power is coming from the obelisk Atwell claims is either in orbit around the planet or somehow connected to the surface. I shifted dimensions when we first investigated the Lethe deep space. I think we're going to find a lot of secrets if we ever get back to Bayon and take what we know into the lower levels of that place. We're pulling power across four star systems? Hunter asked. That's worth investigating on its own. I don't want to go down there, Zoni said. I was weirded out enough by what we saw on the surface. The good news is things are starting to make sense now, Hunter mused. What about the Dunkirk? She is undoubtedly fitted with the same technology as the Psy Key, ma'am, Yili said. So is the Saratoga. Beg pardon? Honora asked. The ship we rescued at D-Point? The same. According to the readings you brought back, the scattering field was heavily localized somewhere in the vicinity of that ship. If alien technology is what we're looking for, she's as good a place to start as any. I do recall she was the source of an energy wave and there were reports of strange encounters aboard, not to mention that crazy moment we all appeared in the same place at Magellan Pass, even though we were spread out all over the sector, Honora said. Saratoga didn't wink out like we thought she would. Rebecca would be the one to ask. Saratoga is parked at Core 3 right next to what's left of the Dunkirk. I will bet my next paycheck both ships are wired up just like this one, Curtis stated. Jason insisted we protect the Dunkirk. I think he had a hunch we might find something like this, Honora added. If what you say is true, Commander, it means we can blink back to Core 3 and blink out again with three ships instead of one. You mean to start a new fleet, ma'am? No, but I want to give Yili enough time to take a close look at both of those ships. If we've made this much progress aboard the Psyche, there's no telling what we'll come up with aboard those cruisers. That sounds like a good plan, provided we can make it work, Zack said. Let's see what Admiral Hughes has to say first, Hunter replied. As much as I'd like to learn the whole story sooner rather than later, the fact is we've got a lot of Marines, pilots, and crew in harm's way on the surface of Bayonne 3, and I'm still missing two starships. Let's reconvene in two hours. Yilly, keep this quiet for now. Hunter handed the engineer the strange egg-shaped device. All of the officers except Dr. Doverly excused themselves. What have you got, Doctor? The Admiral isn't fit for duty, but he's got information we're going to need if we're going to make any progress against Atwell. Is he well enough to debrief? To a point, the doctor replied. He's no longer pink-clouding and he's no longer hallucinating. Whatever they did to his mind is going to have lasting effects possibly for some time. Can you tell me anything about what happened to the man? Honora sighed, closed her eyes, and prepared herself. Flashes of the Admiral's frozen expression of terror disrupted her thinking momentarily. She pushed them aside. He was exposed to an alien mind of immense size and power. I only pieced together some of the details. The Ithis are an ancient race that expanded across a galactic arm primarily consisting of planets much larger than our own. Theirs was a hive society that evolved closer and closer to autonomous organisms while retaining the ability to tap into the strength of the collective in times of stress. Best of both worlds. Something like that, Doverly replied. Hughes discovered this collective mind can be used offensively to overwhelm a lesser being's thoughts. A weaker man would have been driven irretrievably insane by the alien concepts the Admiral was exposed to. The Ithis found the size and scope of their hive brain made it difficult to inspire important things like ambition or aggression or drive in their member beings. That's what they were trying to get from Hughes. They wanted his more primitive human ferocity. They believed if they could harness it, 
They could combine it with two billion years of their own evolution and use it to conquer our galaxy. So they had no trouble forcing Hughes to join their cause? If he resisted, they just overwhelmed his thoughts. Precisely, Commander. He's not a traitor. He's a prisoner. And his own mind is his jail. Jace paused for a moment, allowing the doctor's last statement to sink in. After all the strike fleet had been through, and all their attempts to catch Colonel Atwell had cost them, the simple truth of what Admiral Hughes had been through caught her off guard. Up to now, finding the Admiral had been just another one of Jace's mission objectives. She hadn't really considered the human factor until now. Then there was the issue of the Dunkirk's crew. Even though Jason Hunter had managed to land a boarding party on the deck of Hughes's strike cruiser early in the game, and even though they had discovered the first secret of the Lethe Deep Space, they still weren't any closer to finding the men and women who had crewed the flagship on its first journey into Gitarn space. The whole operation reeked of desperate administrative subterfuge. What was the Dunkirk doing unescorted in potentially hostile space in the first place? Why was the Bayon system left undefended with civilians on the ground and a vitally important scientific and agricultural operation underway? Was Skywatch inviting a tangle with the Sarn? For Commander Hunter, it always came back to the Sarn. She had never gotten over how close DSS Minstrel had come to touching off a shooting war with the Empire. Had she the authority, she would have pinned another medal on Rebecca's uniform just for her handling of the dispute between the Invector Squadron and what was left of Argent's strength in Bayon 3's orbit. Getting a strike battleship back in operation with a crew of five and bluffing her way to a stalemate was pure genius, and it neatly validated Jace's judgment when she had given Islington and her ambitious crew command of the baby of the Perseus Task Force. Jason wanted to know what was going on between the less-than-savory elements in the Gitarn underground and Atwell. Jace had always cautioned her brother to consider interpreting battlefield alliances in terms other than those provided by his long association with various pirate factions. True, the captain had found connections other officers never would, but his early successes had a habit of coloring his expectations and leading him off on more than his fair share of wild goose chases. This time, it wasn't the Gitarn criminal element. There was something going on between Atwell and the Sarn. Nothing else could explain the brazen violation of the ceasefire at Bayon 3. Commander Hunter also had her suspicions the sudden appearance of the unidentified alien faction armed with rifle cutter batteries wasn't entirely unconnected to the Empire. Jace was still sorting her options when Sergeant Benning and Charles Hughes appeared at the entry hatch. Attention on deck, Jace said quietly. She and Doverly rose to their feet as the sergeant ushered a broken man through the doorway. While neither officer was technically obligated to come to attention for off-duty personnel, regardless of rank, especially aboard a ship under their command, Jace took her respect for the fleet and its officers' corps seriously. Her brother was the same way. It may not have been required under regulations, but it was the gallant thing to do, and therefore it was the hunter thing to do. By now, the Admiral was dressed in a clean service uniform with new athletic-style shoes and a medical monitoring bracelet. He looked a little stronger and just a little healthier now that he had a chance to eat some real food instead of synthesized intensive care nutrients for a change. Jace invited him to the head position at the table and took her seat after. How are you feeling, sir? Much better, Jace. I have to admit Argent was getting a little cold for human habitation there at the end. Fleet bean counters don't understand fusion-powered life support doesn't cost extra, Doverly quipped. Hughes smiled and nodded. I trust your accommodations are suitable such as they are. I'm afraid our choice of ships is limited at the moment. The commander acknowledged Sergeant Benning, who was taking up far more space than any man should at the CIC entry hatch. My mobile security detail will see to anything you need. You're worried about me. Jace didn't answer right away. The look on Dr. Doverly's face told the story of what the senior officers had been discussing for days. What makes you think that, Admiral? Jace asked, gently tapping the ball back into the Admiral's half of the court. I've been under alien influence for weeks. According to Captain Hunter's report, I threatened his ship on behalf of a hostile enemy, and now I'm sitting in your combat information center when I should be dead. Jace didn't miss a beat. You told Captain Hunter several things I found remarkable, Admiral. First, you alerted him to the fact he was up against automated ships. That much was easily verified. You also told him Colonel Atwell believed he could use the alien technology against the invaders. What invaders? 
The Ithis have provoked more than one star-traveling species. The reason they survive is because of what they do when a civilization like ours fights back. They can't be killed in the same way we can. Wiping out a thousand of their number has the same effect on their overall vitality as taking a shower does to one of us. Billions of bacteria might be wiped out in a matter of seconds, but we remain oblivious to it because it happens on a scale we can't perceive. To truly attract their full attention would require military action on a scale we can't even imagine, much less engineer. And these other star-traveling species are bringing their war to our space? Doverly asked. Exactly. They pursue the collective mind of this ancient hive, desperately trying to understand its technology, believing if they can just master one more piece of the puzzle, the odds will shift in their favor. What inevitably happens is they end up going to war with some other civilization on the same crusade as theirs. Both lesser species wipe themselves out, and the Ethis don't even notice. So Atwell is mustering a defense against some force other than the Ithis. Several forces other than the Ithis. One is believed to be based somewhere inside the Dead Reach. Another has occupied space around the Kraken Nebula. Both of those regions are on the opposite side of the Raleo system, Admiral, Jace replied. How can Atwell possibly know the plans of ships and crews that far out? The species mounting attacks against the Ethis are coming from all directions, Commander. They've touched off at least five full-scale fleet engagements so far, one of which cost the Sarn two battle groups. It hit Jace and Honora at the same time. That's why they moved into Gitarn space, the doctor said. They're looking for room to retreat, Jace concluded. Now what happened to Bayonne makes sense. You've got the best chance of unraveling this thing before it gets to our space commander, Hughes said. You're much further along in understanding I this technology than even Atwell, probably because you haven't been exposed to the mind-warping expanse of their biological presence. Your crew hasn't been exposed to the seethe. I strongly recommend you see to it none of your officers or men encroach on Ithis territory. The effects are... unsettling. Admiral, where's your crew? Hunter asked. Near as I can tell, they were transported into Lethe Deeps and imprisoned somewhere under the surface. The Ithis function quite well at considerable depths, Commander. Our technology is capable, but once human beings reach underground depths of more than four or five miles, the pressure can be deadly. Our best guess with the Dunkirk's instruments put the complex under Lethe Deeps at 200 miles straight down. The statement landed on the table formed by the horizontal crystal surface of the CIC display like excavated rock. They come from under the ground, Commander. They grow entire worlds inside planets, and then burst into the open like worms escaping from a decomposed body. And because of their technology, you'll never know they were there until it's too late. The magnitude of the Admiral's warning was hard for Jace to bear. What if an advanced alien race could simply teleport a seed into the very core of a planet, grow an attacking army of heaven knows what, and then explode onto the surface by surprise? How would the inhabitants of that planet even begin to prepare? And what if that was exactly what was happening to Bayonne 3 and Hallow's Moon? Hughes produced a key disk. This may or may not be of use to you. The Dunkirk intercepted a fair number of transmissions on the edge of Raleo space. Some were scrambled and hard to copy, but others were broadcast in the clear, as if they were distress signals of some kind. Aside from the Sarn, we counted five distinct species and got some basic data on the types of ships and weapons they have. Your strike force encountered one of them over Bayonne. There's four others, and if my surmise is correct, they are out for blood. Thank you, Admiral. Your experience and bravery may eventually make the difference. Don't forget my ship was exposed to the conditions over Raleo 2 for more than a solar day. There may be clues hidden in the deck plates themselves. I just hope those at Skywatch Command who listened to me originally can find a way to overcome the all-is-well faction before it's too late. Jace's comlink beeped. Hunter. Ma'am, we're being hailed. By? The Office of the Judge Advocate General. Well, folks, I'd like to continue this conversation, but I have to take a call from my lawyer. Hunter acknowledged Hughes as she stepped around the display surface. Admiral. Honora chuckled as Hunter excused herself and started for the Psy Keys Bridge. Chapter 21 Captain on the Bridge Hunter stepped up to the con and activated the master channel tie-in. On screen, the face of Lieutenant Colonel Oscar Dorset appeared. Behind him was an appropriately official-looking view of his office aboard Allegheny Station. 
Commander, I sure would like to know what the hell it is you think you're doing. Good morning, Oscar. Just going for a little cruise. I brought Alicia along to keep an eye on me. She knows how you worry. Jace. Colonel, I'd like to tell you all about my vacation plans, but plausible deniability and all that. You're an officer of the court. No sense in gumming up your career. The handringers can't complain much. I have a police escort. Zoni almost laughed. Dorset sighed. I knew I was in for an adventure when I agreed to represent one of the famous hunters, but what I didn't sign up for was a second job keeping you out of trouble or explaining your liberal interpretations of orders from flag officers to other flag officers. Look on the bright side, Counselor. When we win, you'll be the first to know the final score. If this thing goes south, Commander, we're not going to be able to just paper it over at Skywatch Command. Oscar, I've seen you work. If anyone can paper this over, it's you. I appreciate the compliment, but if I'm going to march into court with the angels on my side waving papers in the air, I need a cooperative client. I'm a soldier, Oscar. I'm not accustomed to working a desk. I know. And as someone who is accustomed to working a desk, I'm here to tell you it's just as dangerous around here as it is out there, especially if we don't have the clout we need to make your enemies back down at the appropriate times. Nobody ordered me to stay put, and someone has to run down this evidence. Admiral Jackson didn't confine you to the base, but he suggested you stay out of the line of fire. And when admirals make suggestions, commanders should listen. He's one of your few friends at this late date. The decision's yours, and I can't stop you, but I recommend extreme caution. Colonel, there are two possibilities. Either I succeed, in which case we'll all be safe, or I'll fail. In which case it won't matter. If anyone's looking for me, tell them I've gone fishing. Psy key out. Zoni took her headphones off. Fishing sounds grand right about now. No argument from me, Commander, Jace replied as she rose from the command chair. Steady as she goes, pilot. Best speed to... New contact. A stab of ice shot through Jace's midsection. According to space lane control, there shouldn't be any other ships out this far. Psy Key was more than a billion miles from the inner system comm buoys. That could only mean one thing. They had been shadowed from Core 3 by an assassin, and now they were making their move. What have you got, Cobb? Intermittent readings aft bearing 140, parallel course and speed. Reflection. At this range? No. Cobb scoffed. Designate Juliet X-ray 1, range 680,000 miles. Jace calmly fastened her shock harness. Take us to alert condition 2, standby battle stations. Zoni, get me engineering. Aye, ma'am, you're on. Yili, we're going to need to do a little stunt flying. Are we up to it? You're 4x4 four four on all flight modes, ma'am. We'll keep it high and tight. Acknowledged, engineer. Take the reactor to full. Stand by for high-power maneuvers. By now, everyone on the bridge had fastened their harnesses. Any alert condition generally required active duty crew to secure their stations. The romantic notions of bridge crews being thrown out of their shock couches in battle certainly made for dramatic storytelling, but in split-second engagements it could be the difference between survival and 60,000 miles of wreckage. Zack, veer us off. X-5, breakaway mark, negative 40. All ahead, flank 3. Affirmative, Captain. Helm answering 355, mark 320, true. Engines ahead, flank 3. All at once, the agile little frigate spun out of her course and rocketed into the darkness of space. Juliet X-Ray 1 matched her turn for turn. Evasive pattern. Give me a wing-heavy turn starboard. X plus 10 relative. The Psy Key banked in the opposite direction, performing a textbook weave. It was an elementary evasive tactic, to be sure, but Jace's experience was at work. She wasn't necessarily trying to avoid her shadow. She was probing their flight envelope. The more time Cobb had, the more likely they would get some kind of an ID on their pursuer, even without going active. Every scanner reflection required more than a nine-second delay. And exactly nine seconds later, Juliet X-Ray 1 rolled back into the pursuit track smartly. Textbook flying. Pilot, I think our opposite number is a show-off. What say you? I think if they were hostile, they would have taken a shot at us by now, ma'am. Jace pondered the situation. Juliet X-Ray 1 wasn't closing range, but it also wasn't going away. Helm, bring us... Threat board, Cobb shouted. We're locked up. The jangling weapons lock alarm sounded at the tactical station and Helm simultaneously. Jace didn't react right away. Captain? Zack asked with an urgent edge. 
The battle computer's best guess at the hull design of the hostile contact appeared at the center of the Psy Key's bridge screen. Frigate class. 100,000 ton displacement or better. The alarm continued to sound. Captain, all stop. That made even Cobb turn around. Commander, with all due respect. Pilot, Jace said smoothly, all stop. Aye, ma'am, Zack replied tentatively. The Psy Key slowed in space until she reached zero acceleration. Her drive field did the rest. Twenty seconds later, she was at station keeping. Nine seconds later, so was Juliet X-Ray 1. She held at a range of 400,000 miles. The weapons lock cleared. The unsettling warning tone ceased. It was enough to bring even Zoni to her feet. What the hell? Zack whispered. The commsat repeater beeped urgently. Captain, we're being hailed. On screen. The carrier wave appeared first, displaying the rarely seen green, white, and yellow colors of Skywatch FFG 840. The designator for the escort frigate, DSS Minstrel. The face of Lieutenant Commander Rebecca Islington faded into view. Ma'am, she said, sorry about the missile lock, but you weren't getting the subtle version of my message. It was one of those rare moments when Jace Hunter was at a loss for words. Finally, she took a breath. I was trying to keep you out of this, Rebecca. Perseus sticks together. They'll say you're a fanatic, Commander. I never forgot your pep talk on our first day in the task force. And with all due respect, ma'am, your escape from Core 3 space was pretty sloppy. I'll grant you that much. Skywatch Command has likely already declared us AWOL. Aren't you away from your patrol route? I'm sorry, Commander, we didn't copy that. Jace smiled. She had to admit the example she had set was rubbing off a little on her captains. Whether or not that was a good thing remained to be seen. I suppose you want to know where we're headed? The thought crossed my mind. I haven't much extra firepower to offer, but I figure two frigates are better than one. Rebecca's eyes flashed. And I don't leave my wingman. Even Cobb grinned at that one. Very well. Take a shuttle over. I have some new toys to show you, and I'd like to introduce you to someone you may have heard of. Chapter 22 The still unidentified boarding parties clustered around the Starship Constellation's reactor shielding didn't realize the enormity of their tactical miscalculation until long after it was too late. Only a token sentry or two were posted at the compartment entrance. Almost all the others had their backs turned to the rest of the engineering section, and the deactivation of the deck alert systems had only been verified temporarily. It would have taken considerable time and effort to permanently disable the Constellation's security systems, and it would have been worth the effort because the alternative was exactly what happened 19 seconds later. In an instant, the entire deck was fully illuminated. A moment later, the lights went out, all of them, including the console indicators. Only one member of the attacking forces managed to activate a handheld light before all hell broke loose. A powered rifle descended from its ceiling mount, snapped right nearly 180 degrees like a cybernetic snake's head, and opened fire. Blinding light strobed in the darkness. The first white-hot lances of plasma energy tore through the chest plating of the nearest target. A bubbling scream echoed in the pitch-black chamber. The handheld light tumbled to the floor as the members of the boarding party scrambled in all directions. The rifle pivoted again, pumping 12 rounds a second into the foot-thick reactor shield. Sparks and oxygen bursts exploded all over the chamber. Orange glowing debris skidded across the floor as the deck defense gun claimed another victim. And another. Two of the boarders ran towards the nearest hatch, only to find it magnetically sealed by the alert systems. A furious barrage of weapons fire immolated the doorway in a bloom of fire and superheated gas. Fumes rose from the plasma-scored metal as bodies collapsed to the deck. The shrieking sounds of panic mixed with air-shattering impact reports as the power rifle fired again and again. Sixteen seconds after the first shot was fired, no survivors remained in reactor shielding four. Boarding parties neutralized, Captain. Very well, send security squads six and eight to secure the bridge. Have them report directly to auxiliary control, Flynn replied. He activated his comlink. Captain to engineering. Engineering, Simmons. The enemy threat has been neutralized, Engineer. Equip your team with new friendly transponders. You are authorized to perform a Phase 2 reset and re-establish control of Constellation's reactors as soon as your permissions cycle. Report to me directly. Aye, Captain. Flynn keyed his comlink off. All right, Chief. Let's reauthorize our command codes and prepare to sound an alert condition downgrade. 
Bosa went to work rebuilding the permissions table for the Constellation's command computer. It was a laborious process, but it was the one physical object-dependent function a Starship's computer required to maintain security in the event of a hull breach or boarding action. Once a vessel's hardware was compromised or attackers gained physical access to the system, it was necessary to generate new cryptographic keys for the senior officers, lest a Trojan left behind by the attacking forces use the reactivated command computer to cripple the ship or regain control of its systems at a crucial moment. You are now eligible for voice print, sir. Computer, this is Lieutenant Commander Raymond Flynn, captain of the Skywatch Destroyer Constellation. Report match for voice print and post assignment as commanding officer of this vessel. Authorization Grizzly 6014. The monotone voice of the command computer responded over the speakers. Acknowledged. Raymond Flynn. Authorization Grizzly 6014. Officer posted. Lieutenant Commander Raymond Flynn is now in command of DSS Constellation DDW 1919. Flynn's comlink status indicator shifted green. The other officer's authorizations will come online automatically as the command computer reevaluates the permissions table, starting with Lieutenant Simmons. Let's get to the bridge. Chapter 23 Colonel Moody had made his decision, for better or worse. It was clear even if they navigated the gateway back to the besieged planet, he, Sergeant Alexander, and Sable would be of limited help to Skywatch forces on Bayon 3. The reported scale of the combat was quite a ways beyond the capabilities of a two-man fire team, regardless of their skill or experience. Mu was urgently aware, however, of the fact the crew of Paladin 6-4 had to be rescued soon. The stasis fields Mu had established aboard the crashed vessel before venturing out into the triad jungle to find help needed maintenance, and the vessel itself needed better camouflage in order to survive close proximity with enemy forces. The recon team also needed to re-establish contact with their battlespace information systems and Ariane. Sergeant Alexander and Sable advanced in parallel. Each was equipped with the field combat equivalent of a surgeon's scalpel, easily capable of excising an enemy solitaire or creature silently and from ranges that would make a counterattack impractical. Mu moved by turns with the sergeant, with each marine covering the other for the next 15 yards or so. The colonel had equipped himself with a brand new TK-40 recovered from the firearm storage under Alaska base. He heeded the silent advice of the marines recorded in the battle Alexander had found in the base security matrix. Plasma lance fire only unless there were some compelling reason to do otherwise. The sergeant checked his Atmos handheld at regular intervals. The device was providing him with not only a real-time monitoring of the moon's atmospheric conditions, it was also streaming its readings on an internal graph and comparing the new data to a rolling average of the already collected data. If anything got more than a half percentage point out of whack, the device would instantly notify the fire team. Sable was in her element. Under regulations, K-9 units were almost always required to wear portable life support in action. Even if outdoor conditions were the equivalent of weekend trip to the beach weather, the fact was recon marines did everything in opposites. It was a physical manifestation of their belief in expecting the unexpected. As far as Skywatch was concerned, trips to the beach were great fun, as long as recon survives the unexpected gas attack. The impeccably trained German Shepherd trotted along, watching carefully for any unusual movement. She was by far the most heavily armed dog in a light year. Her shoulder-mounted white heat laser weapons could be activated by the sergeant from ranges of up to a quarter mile and could be set to kill anything he marked with the appropriate range indicator. If he were wearing the right face gear, he could vaporize enemy personnel by simply looking at them. By now, the fire team had advanced some 2,000 yards beyond the southern perimeter of the base. The electronic frontier was still operational, which gave the group some tactical options in the event they were confronted by hostile forces. Not far from the edge of the Alaska fortifications, a low ridge shadowed the relatively flat region in the gloom. Mu motioned the group to pause a moment. What do you estimate the height on that incline? It's about 70 feet from the deck to the edge, sir, Alexander replied. I'm getting the same readings from beyond it. Whatever Charton's men encountered might still be here. Look sharp, Sergeant, Mu replied. He moved up, making his way towards the nearest edge of the landmark. The ridge extended for at least a half mile east of the recon team's position. It appeared to be roughly uniform height all the way to its tail far in the distance. Finally, the colonel reached the incline, 
He crouched, using hand signals to notify the sergeant he had detected no hazards. A few moments later, Alexander reached the colonel's position. Sable stood a hundred yards off, watching the two Marines carefully. Next time, let's bring some aerial remotes, Mu joked. Then we can investigate the space monsters from the comfort of our living rooms. A fine plan, Colonel. Any hazard in climbing up there to take a look? Only if we're noticed, sir. Sable and I are going to be the toughest to detect. Then you're the man for the job. Just a quick scan over the edge of the rock. Record everything you can. Then we'll take the information back to base and analyze it. I can set up a ground remote. It won't give us the fidelity of an aerial unit, but it will at least tell us if the enemy is on the move. Outstanding. Approved. Aye, Alexander replied. He made a couple of adjustments to his belt pack and slung his TK-95 across his back. Cover me. Mu settled on his elbows and aimed his weapon towards the top edge of the ridge. The sergeant began his ascent. Small rocks, gravel, and dust slid down the incline behind Alexander. Despite the treacherous terrain, marine training overcame as it always did. In a matter of seconds, Alexander had reached his goal. He quickly configured his remote sensor and spiked a composite frame into the ground. He attached the unit and activated it. Then he crawled a little higher and laid flat, supporting his optical rangefinders with his elbows. It took more than a little effort on the sergeant's part to keep from being overcome by vertigo. The lesion covering the area beyond the ridge looked as if it descended an incalculable distance directly towards the center of the planet. Unidentifiable biological structures were growing out of the chasm, like some kind of bizarre arrangement of internal organs seeping out of a wound. An inexplicable feeling of unease gripped Roy Alexander's senses. He felt as if the very core of his being was vibrating like the deepest string on a bass vial. He could sense power coming from the enormous fissure beyond anything he had ever experienced. The readings from his instruments were no easier to understand. According to both the Atmos handheld and his ground remote sensor, the chasm at the base of the ridge descended at least 11 miles before widening into a much larger chamber. What was clear from the readings was this wasn't a natural phenomenon. There was no question now why the 98th Recon and Major Charton's men had been attacked. Their base was scarcely a mile from the rough equivalent of an alien subterranean city. Alexander rolled over onto his back, desperately trying to fight the incredible sense of on-edge he was experiencing. It was like someone else was forcing all the muscles in his body to tense up to the point where they were rock hard. Every joint and limb was cramped at the same time. He allowed himself to slide a few feet down the edge. His vital signs were redlining. Finally, he felt the phenomenon start to fade. Once he could control his legs again, he moved further down the ridge. He checked his handheld. At least the ground remote was functioning. The next thing he knew, he could see a face. Colonel Moody was shouting at him, but he couldn't hear the words. Chapter 24 The observation deck aboard DSS Psy Key performed a similar function aboard the compact little warship, despite the fact it wasn't at all similar in size or luxury to the corresponding facilities aboard either Argent or Fury. Jace Hunter found herself retreating to the isolated compartment more and more often as her tiny squadron neared the site of the Battle of Bayon III. This time, however, her sanctuary had been discovered. Commander. Hunter looked over her shoulder. Standing in the doorway was Rebecca Islington. My secret is out. Jace replied, turning back to the view of core space visible through the angled forward viewport. My engineering chief gets impatient with me when I hide on sea deck aboard Minstrel, Islington said. Says it makes his crew nervous. I keep trying to tell them I'm harmless, but these gold leaves have a way of intimidating able crewmen. It only gets worse when they turn silver. The two captains stood side by side, contemplating the emptiness along the edge of the Core 3 system. What's the plan if we run into trouble at Blackburn again? We arm ourselves with a couple of good sturdy clubs and take care of business. I'm at a point in all this where I honestly don't care what Atwell was trying to accomplish. The facts are clear. He put thousands of people in harm's way, got the crews of more than a few starships killed or badly injured, and almost cost my brother his life as well. You're holding out hope Captain Hunter survived? Oh, I know he survived. Like I told my mom, he's up to something. And when I drag him out from under whatever is about to crush his risk-taking, wise-cracking self, he'll laugh it off and go find some other way to ride the line. He's been doing it since we were kids. 
It took my dad a year to apologize to me after Jason and I got in a fight because he was being stupid and about to burn the house down. I took the matches away from him and we ended up in a closed eyes, fists flailing knockdown it took both my parents to break up. I was the one who got in trouble naturally, but my mom and dad later agreed I did the right thing. Did Captain Hunter ever apologize? You don't always have to call him by his rank, Rebecca. You have my permission to call him a reprobate in private. I do it all the time. He learned a long time ago not to pull rank on me. Jace's eyes twinkled. Rebecca wondered how she had pulled off that trick. He's an honorable man and a good officer. I would expect him to recognize when he's wrong. We've fought like cats and dogs all our lives, Jace replied. But I'll never forget the day of our senior prom. Since we're twins, we were the same year in school and we participated in all the same school events. Fate should always give sisters a year in either direction so they don't have to deal with brothers on important days like proms. I fretted for weeks knowing full well Jason was going to do something embarrassing in front of my date, but he wore a white tie and a dashing yellow rose and treated both of us like it was a royal wedding. My date even asked me about it later and I had to tell him I was as surprised as he was. I had never seen Jason so gallant before. It was probably because of that pouting redhead he convinced to dance with him. That was the day both of us grew up and our relationship changed. Later that night, he even apologized for the matches incident. I was stunned he even remembered something that had happened eight years prior. Something happens to boys that inspires them to become men, Rebecca said. Happened to my brothers, too, even though they were both older than me. One day they were horrid beasts ruining my life, and then the next day they had these deep voices and broad shoulders, and they were helping me carry groceries without anyone asking. Well, prom or no prom, it doesn't get him off the hook for making me chase him all over the galaxy. Sabrina tells me the Shrike was identified in system right before Jason's fighter was destroyed. As much as the doctor wants Lorley on head, I think there's more going on here than a simple accident. Especially considering the hastily prepared little recording device he left behind. Rebecca took a breath and hesitated. I wish we had more firepower, ma'am. I wish I could do my job without having to invest half my productive effort keeping admirals happy. One would think by the time you get promoted to a flag rank you would recognize the rest of Skywatch doesn't have any obligation to make you feel better, but stars on shoulders seem to have a habit of turning otherwise mature men and women into toddlers who have to be continually comforted and persuaded. It's exhausting. Are you getting fury back? Sabrina tells me you were formally relieved. I'll get my ship back. If I survive, of course. Jace grinned. No doubt I'll have to do the old tactical two-step to explain misappropriating a stolen warship, but if Skywatch Command has its way, whatever leads our crews paid for in blood at Bay on 3 will be ice cold before we get back there at full strength. We can't wait that long. I wish we had at least one heavy, Rebecca said. Escorts can make a lot of noise and tear up the furniture, but we just don't have the horsepower to land the kind of body blows we need to overcome what Dunkirk and Argent reported over that planet. By the way, is it true Curtis and Chief Buckmaster developed an autonomous fighter and mounted fusion torpedoes on it? They did indeed. Another of my brother's semi-legal stunts. Turns out he outright stole some of my reloads when the strike fleet was being reprovisioned in the Rho Theta system. That could tip the balance, ma'am. True, but we don't have any ships that can launch fighters at the moment, and even if we jury-rigged something out of Psy Key's shuttle deck, we can't rearm or swap fusion plants. If we could figure it out, Zack can fly him remotely. It's something to think about if we ever get to the surface. We can launch fighters out of Komanov's garrison alongside gunships and mechs. Assuming there is a garrison still there, once we get planetside and we get Zoni and Yili's technology tree lit up, we'll see if we can hop dimensions like Atwell does. And if we can, we just might manage to get Skywatch back in the war before it's too late.